So thanks for coming out. Today what I want to talk about is the, the lean startup for enterprise Java developers. And the way I want to kick this off is I want to start by kind of setting the scene and clarifying the problem that we're actually trying to solve here. So the problem is your boss comes to you and he has this great idea for some software you need to build. It's going to change the world. And you're like, great, OK, so you start coding. And you know, you're thinking about it, you do a little more coding, maybe you sit back and think for a while, and then you really get down to some serious coding. And you're doing it all right. You're using Kanban to limit your work in progress so that you don't have too many things going on at the same time. You're doing daily stand-up meetings, pair programming to make sure that you write the best code you possibly can. You're even doing test-driven development, red, green, refactor, so you're doing everything right. It's going to work out, right? Success is at hand. This is going to be an awesome launch. All of your specs and tests and JUnit tests, they're all passing. You've architected this to scale. It's just going to be awesome. And so like the last final things, you kind of instrument the site so that it's, it's ready. And you launch. And it's like you threw a party and nobody came after all that work. And it's crazy, because you, you thought you'd done everything right. As an engineer, you'd coded, and you'd written more code, and you'd thought about your coding really meaningfully, and you'd worked nights and weekends. You'd done what it takes to launch this. You were using best processes, and uh, you were working with the product owner on a regular basis. You'd paired. You were doing test-driven development. All the engineering practices were just the way they needed to be. But when you actually launched the site, nobody was interested after all that work. And it's that problem that the lean startup is set to address. So who here has read the book, just have a sense of the room? OK. So I'm going to do two things today. The first thing is I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about what the lean startup is at a manifesto level, what the kind of problems it is trying to solve, and how it solves them. And then the other thing I want to do, because it's a programming conference, not some kind of business conference, is talk about, from an engineering practices perspective, what are some of the things that we need to be doing differently to be able to solve these problems. So we're all used to the idea of having cross-functional teams, right, and, and kind of broadening the, the sets of skills you have. So you might be a, a server-side developer, but it wouldn't surprise me if these days you know a little bit of HTML and CSS, maybe. JavaScript. Uh, but I want to take it a step further and say that we need to take a wider range of responsibility as developers. It's like it used to be. All you had to do was write code and throw it over to the testing group, and it was their problem to figure out whether it worked and to send it back to you if it didn't. And equally, it used to be you could just throw finished code once it had passed test and QA into production, and it wasn't your problem if it wasn't very, main, uh, wasn't very easy to run in production. You didn't need to care. And obviously, between the kind of test-driven development movement and the DevOps movement that we're now seeing and continuous integration and stuff like that, we need to take more and more responsibility for a wider range of the, the value chain of delivering software. Well, the next step I think we're going to see, and actually I've got a friend, uh, Tim Berglund from GitHub, who's going to be giving a presentation at a uh, conference next week in New York called Kill All the Product Owners. And the idea is that GitHub, they don't have product owners. So there's a responsibility instead for the engineering team, for the programmers like ourselves, to kind of have some responsibility for the business side of things as well. So that in some ways, we need to think like our boss so that when they come with this cool piece of software, rather than just asking the question, can it be built, which usually the answer is yes these days, the much more interesting question is, should it be built? Should we actually waste time building this? Is this the best way to learn stuff? And if we don't take that responsibility, we're kind of doomed to have, continue to have these projects where we spend nine months of our life building an amazing piece of software that nobody ever uses. So the idea of the Lean Startup then was basically Eric Ries was a geek. He was a CTO of a tech startup, and he'd wasted nine months of his life on a particular project, which, again, was very well engineered, very well planned, managed using Agile and Lean and Kanban principles. But 
actually added no business value because nobody was interested in it when they launched the functionality. So th I think there's two things that you need to take away from the lean startup. First is, what is a startup? Because how many people here work for larger companies, like enterprises, big corporations? Yeah, like a lot of the conferences I'm involved with, at least half of the audience is enterprise, sometimes more. So the question is, does this even relate to you if you work for a big company? And then the other question is, if it does relate to you, what exactly would we want to do differently? So the first thing I like from this book is the definition of a startup. It doesn't involve garages or late nights or less than eight employees or being able to take your dog to work or anything like that. The definition is a human institution designed to create a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So immediately, this does exclude certain classes of software development. If you're creating version 43 of your software, and you were involved with creating the other 42 versions, you have either no competitors or you know exactly what they're planning to build over the next year, and you know, your boss has regular golf outings with 100 people who actually buy your software and knows exactly what they want, then a lot of these principles won't apply because then you simply have an execution problem. You know exactly what the features should be, you know exactly what they need to do, and all you need to do is build the stuff you've been asked for. But my experience has been, irrespective of the size of company we work for, I'm seeing less and less of those kinds of projects these days. And I'm seeing much more projects where we often think we know what we need to build, and then we build it, and then we find out that actually that wasn't what our customers or clients or users were really interested in. So we have to spend a bunch of time iterating to find out what problems we should really solve. And if we're doing that, we should think about how we engineer that first cut, given that we're not really building it to deliver software, we're building it to gain learning, to figure out what we're doing. So one example I like to, to use from the book uh, is one about snap tax, which was really a lean startup story. The idea was to allow people to be able to do their taxes by basically taking a phone and taking a photograph of a few pieces of paper, like the, the paper you get from your employer at the end of the year and stuff like that, to really simplify the tax process. And it worked out pretty well. A very small engineering team got together and built this thing. Uh, what's interesting, though, is this lean startup story of a small number of engineers building something very quickly that ended up becoming successful. Well, it's actually part of the TurboTax group, which is part of Intuit, which is a software development company with 8,000 developers, or 8,000 employees, excuse me. So this wasn't a small company at all. And the interesting thing about the definition of the lean startup is that it has nothing to do with the size of organization you work for. Uh, there's been some really interesting stuff going on recently with the, uh, the US government trying to apply some of these principles to get more better value software delivered for less taxpayer dollars. So this isn't limited to companies that have less than 2,500 employees. It's irrespective of the size of the uh, business. It's only a function of the amount of uncertainty there is in the software that you're actually developing. So if a lean startup applies to you, if there is some degree of uncertainty, if you don't absolutely know what needs to be built, you may know what your boss has asked you to build, or the business analysts, or the product owner, or whatever you call them in your organization. But if you don't know what the actual customers are really going to want when you launch this thing, if you've ever had that experience where you build something and what you thought was gonna be the most important feature ends up not being the most important feature, what do you do different? Well, a phrase that comes to mind that's worth thinking about is something from Mark Andreessen, the idea of product market fit. And with product market fit, what we're talking about here is there are two basic phases in the life cycle of any product, before and after you get this. Before you get product market fit, your focus should actually be on learning. It should be on learning, what do I need to build to get large numbers of people to pay me money or attention or something else that I value for the software? And a lot of people, and after market, uh, product market fit, it's much more about scaling. It's much more about saying, okay, now how can we hire 200 more people? How can we scale 40 more servers? Things like that. 
A lot of people ask me, how do I know whether I've hit product market fit with a particular piece of software or a particular engineering project? Well, good rule of thumb is, if you have the time to ask that question, you probably haven't hit it. Because usually when you do, the, the growth takes off, it's explosive, and you're way too busy to ask questions like that. So before we hit product market fit with any particular product or offering, what we actually need to focus on is not so much traditional delivery of software, but rather validated learning. The deliverable isn't actually the code we write. It's how much we learn about what our customers are actually willing to use or pay for. So I want to just give like two or three quick examples of this just to give a sense as to what it's about. And then we'll get into some of the engineering practices that relate to this. So the, the minimum viable product or, or experimental design is often the, the hard part for people to grasp. So let me give an example, for instance, Zappos. This was a company that wanted to sell shoes online. Well, the kind of huge risk there is, do people actually, are they really going to buy shoes online? I mean, I know I actually still like going into a shoe store because unless I know the particular brand and model and size, I'm not sure that this is some, you know, I'm not sure whether they're going to fit, they're going to be comfortable. So the huge risk here wasn't whether it was possible or not to build an e-commerce store with integrated inventory for warehouses. We know how to solve that problem. It's not cheap, it takes time, it takes engineering effort, there's lots of decisions that need to be made, but e-commerce is a relatively well-solved engineering challenge. The much bigger problem is, how do we know if anyone's even going to buy those shoes? So rather than doing what people would have done maybe 10 years ago, which is, OK, great, I'm going to start building a network of uh, distribution locations, and I'm going to start building a complex e-commerce store that integrates to check our inventory and to manage the automated shipping and stuff, uh, the CEO of Zappos basically went down the road and went into a shoe store on the Upper West Side. And he said, I've got a deal for you. Can I take photos of your shoes? And then if anyone, I'm going to put them up on a website, and if anyone buys them from me, I'm going to come in here and pay you full retail price for your shoes. Now, from a traditional business perspective, this would not seem like a really compelling business, right? So this person is going to sell shoes online for what he buys them for, give free shipping, and spend all of his time running back and forth between the store and uh, a FedEx office or some shipping location to send it out. That sounds like a terrible business, and it is. There's no money in that at all. But what there is is a lot of learning. Because what he was able to do was in just a couple of weeks, he was able to take those photographs, go to the store, work with a uh, developer to just kind of hack together a very simple web app for displaying the photographs, displaying the sizes and the information, and allowing people to buy online. And what he did for a very small amount of money in time is he validated that people would actually buy shoes online. And then once he validated that, it's like, fine, now that I know this works, what sucks the most? And then from improving the web application to working directly with distributors to get a better margin on the product, he could actually start to build the business now that he de-risked that core assumption. I've seen a lot of people waste a lot of money doing this the other way around. I still remember working for, for one particular client in New York that I kind of strongly recommend they didn't go the way they did. But they were going to run an ad to sell this new product in the New York Times. And not only did they want me to build a website for allowing people to buy the product, they wanted it to integrate with their inventory provider and with their shipping and distribution provider. So they ended up spending a few thousand dollars just to get me to do this kind of annoying nightly batch upgrade uh, integration software. I was suggesting, you know, how about we see how many units you sell before we do this integration? But they're like, no, no, it's really important because we're going to sell millions of these things. And so they ended up spending thousands of dollars on me building this functionality, and I think they sold 27 units. So it was a complete waste of time and money because they got it the wrong way around. They weren't validating the big risk, which is, is anyone actually going to buy or use or care about what we're building? Even Groupon, when they started, or when they pivoted, they, they started off as, a, as The Point, which was a group for kind of shared social activism. But the very first Groupon, I mean, right now, Groupon and Living Social and these kind of daily deal sites have substantial engineering teams, right? They kind of sucked up all the engineering talent around them in uh, Chicago and DC, respectively. 
But in the early days, the very first Groupon was a two-for-one pizza deal for the pizza store just right above them in the, in the same building. What's interesting is they had almost no technology. They had a very simple web page, and it was a WordPress blog that they just skinned with their logo and stuff. And then if, they, if somebody actually bought a, a Groupon, they just sent a PDF from FileMaker, the old Mac uh, database tool. But that was enough technology for them to run a few Groupons, see that it would work, so they could then go hire some more engineers and actually build something that would scale and be more reliable and more automated. Dropbox, the kind of valley tech story, right? Uh, so the challenge they had, it, who here has a Dropbox account and uses it? Yeah, so most of the places I go, it's almost everyone. The interesting thing about Dropbox is that while it seems the obvious solution now and it's been wildly successful, if you go back to when they were founded, they were basically going up and down Sand Hill Road saying, we've got this great idea for software that will back up files. And pretty much to a, to a one, all the VC said, yeah, we've been investing in those on and off for the last eight years and we've always lost money. Nobody cares about file sharing software. Now Dropbox said, well, yeah, but here's the difference. We're gonna do it better. So give us a few million dollars. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the VCs still said, yeah, everyone else said they were gonna do it better too and we still lost money, so why would we waste money on this? And so what they actually did in the end, they had to validate that even if, the, and the problem is, this is a non-trivial engineering challenge because they had to make Dropbox a really slick experience. It wasn't something they could hack together in a weekend and build a minimum viable product for. They couldn't prototype this in just a few days or bootstrap it. It ended up taking a, a decent engineering team, I think about a year and a half before they were finally able to launch once they got it funded. So how did they square that circle? Well, what they did was they literally put together this little video of how Dropbox, if anyone remembers, how Dropbox would work, showing you kind of how it would be and what the experience of it would be. And then they dropped in a lot of kind of like geeky jokes and stuff like that. And they signed up thousands, I think it was like 75,000 users, I'm forgetting the number, right up there saying that they had an expression of interest that they might potentially want to do this. And that allowed them to prove, okay, it looks like if you build this, they are likely to come, and that was how they were able to raise funding, build the company, and be as successful as they are today. I often think as programmers, we end up sub-optimizing. I remember I was a CTO of a tech startup in New York a couple of years ago called Skinio, and it was out of Dogpatch Labs, a, a space funded by Polaris Ventures, and I remember having this issue because I was chief technology officer and you know, chief bottle washer. There were three people in the company and I was the one who coded. So one of the challenges I had when I first went there was I realized I got very frustrated by my boss, the CEO, because he would keep wanting to like tap me on the shoulder and talk about what features we should add to the product and how we should prioritize them and what we should work on. And I'm like, hey, I'm actually the only person writing code, so if I'm not writing code, the company isn't moving forwards. So for a while, my hypothesis was he should leave me the heck alone. You know, just go take a vacation somewhere nice and warm, come back in three weeks and I'll show you the code. But I actually realized that that was a sub-optimization. It was optimal for me writing the maximum amount of code and delivering the maximum number of features in a minimum amount of time. It wasn't actually optimal for me adding the most business value though. And I actually found out it ended up breaking out that the best deal was for me to spend 25 to 30 hours a week coding and another 10 to 15 hours a week talking with him about why are we doing this? What's the problems we're really trying to solve? Because often I could take something that was specified like this and come up with a specification that solved the same basic business problem for an amount of coding that felt more like this. So I could maybe in an hour or two of discussion save a couple of days worth of programming. That seems sometimes a little intangible, but I remember, does anyone here, is anyone here old enough to remember when they actually used to talk about valuing programmers by the number of lines of code they wrote? Anyone ever had that? Yeah, so um, it's, it's great because around that time I was involved in the software industry, and I think that was what started my abiding interest in code generation, right? 
okay, I'll solve the problem in a couple of hundred lines, and then I will use that, to, that will describe your domain model or functionality or business rules. Now, how many tens of thousands of lines of code in any arbitrary target language would you like me to deliver so I look like a more productive developer? So that seems pretty stupid. Now, if anything, you almost want to uh, measure developers by how few lines of quality, you know, unpearl like but quality code they, they can write to deliver the features, because the only thing you get with more lines of code is potentially more bugs and more maintenance overhead. It, it's a liability rather than an asset. But if I was to take that one step further, if it seems stupid now to say, hey, he must be the best programmer because he wrote 1,600 lines of code when you only wrote 800. Uh, but now, we're kind of doing the same thing, but at another level. But what we're doing is instead of valuing lines of code over code, we're valuing coding over what actually matters in the early stage, which is how do we most effectively learn what people actually want us to build. So sometimes this is a good starting point when somebody comes to you with a new project, because I often find, especially when I'm, I'm working with teams both in enterprises and in startups, I often find that they come to me way too early. They say, hey, I've got this great idea for X that we should totally build. And often, the, the very first thing I can do is say, what makes you think anyone would actually use that or want that or care for that? And what would be the simplest, cheapest experiments we could run? Whether this is meeting 20 people in Starbucks, throwing up a landing page, or hacking together a very lightweight prototype of this thing we're talking about building. Let's maybe hack together a prototype using a mobile web site rather than building a native iOS app so that we can launch it more quickly and get more feedback quickly. So that like these other companies I was talking about earlier, you can actually get the learning for the minimum amount of coding because they're two separate things. So if you're interested in that area at all, I would definitely recommend checking out the book, The Lean Startup. It's, it's a manifesto rather than a user's guide, so it's a very high-level introduction to the kinds of problems, the, the kinds of ways that you can think about how can we develop new products and new software in a more efficient, in a more agile, in a more lean way. And for anyone who's super excited and actually wants to do a lot of this, I'd also, also recommend another book called Running Lean by Ash Maria, which is one of the best user's guide to actually doing this. I was at South by Southwest the other year. Um, it's like two o'clock in the morning, I'd had a drink or two too many, and some random person, I'm still not quite sure who it was, kind of came up to me and thrust a copy of that book into my hands and said, read this, it will change your life. Bizarrely, you know, I, I was on the flight back to New York the next day, a little hungover, and I read it, and it actually did. It's one of the best, easiest reading, and most uh, actionable set of information I've seen on this whole kind of lean startup thing. There's also other books by uh, Bob Dorf and Steve Blank wrote the, st the Startup Owner's Manual, which is a great book, but it's a really, it's a serious undertaking. The first two I mentioned, they're like 20 bucks and they take three hours to read. So if you are interested in how to start to think about product and how to start to think about how do we build for learning rather than necessarily just build the software we're asked for, I'd recommend checking out those two books. But again, this is a programming conference, so what do we actually do differently at an engineering level if we're taking this lean startup approach? And yes, I know testing's there twice, that's deliberate. So let's go through some of the things and how they change. So firstly, for coding, it's important to really just focus, what is the simplest thing and I find this is really hard sometimes for some engineers. Some, some get it, they're like, oh yeah, that's right. We're just trying to figure out if our customers would use this, so all we want to do is mock up enough functionality to find out. I remember I've had, uh, anyone ever been in one of those product prioritization meetings where there's like two or three people and they're saying, no, this is the most important feature, no, this is the most important feature, and they go back and forth and you feel like it's for about a week, and it's, hopefully it's only 20 minutes. Uh, one of my favorite solutions to that is I'll just add two new buttons. Let's say you've got a website and we're talking about two new features. I'll add two new links to the website. I'll add a little script that will rotate the order of them so people don't just most likely click on the one at the top or the one that's furthest to the left or whatever it is. 
And then both of them, I'll create a landing page saying, thank you for your interest in this feature. It's going to do this, that, and the other. If you want to fill out your email, and we'll let you know as soon as it's live. And then I just look at how many clicks we get and how many emails we get. And then at the end of two weeks, we don't need to discuss which feature is most important to our users. Our users are going to tell us over a two-week period, assuming we have a meaningful number of, of users so that we can get some meaningful data. So it's often much easier to get the validated learning that it would be to build out the whole system, which is good, because I find about seven times out of 10, if you'd built out the whole system, that the validated learning is nobody cares about this. I remember one thing where we'd spec'd out this four-month project to build this amazing piece of functionality. And I'm like, you know, just for kicks and giggles, how about we throw up a link on it right on the home page, introducing people to it? So after that had been up for a month and not a single person had clicked on it, we decided that it probably, there were better things we could do with the engineering time than spend months building that feature, which nobody actually seemed to care about. The one thing I do want to, uh, there's two other things that come to this. One is, if you're building something that's great, that's, that's great, it doesn't necessarily need to be good. And what I mean by that is, if you're actually solving a meaningful problem, I have a lot of like business people and even engineering teams come to me and say, we've got to, you know, before we can deliver this, it must have a perfect user experience and it must have at least these 43 different features. Because if it doesn't integrate all these things and pull all these feeds and do all these amazing things, then nobody's going to use it. There's a small number of cases where that's true, but my general rule of thumb is if you're building something that you need to have everything just perfect for anyone to use it at all, you're probably not solving that big a problem for them. Because if you were, they would put, if you know that you're building something great, when people will put up with your software, even if it crashes their computer twice a day, but they will still use it because it's solving such a big problem in their life. So often, I like when I'm working with teams to try to find the problems where we can do a lousy job of implementing, but it's solving such a big, compelling problem for people that they're going to put up with it anyway, and then hopefully give us some feedback so we can refine and improve the quality if they end up using it. Talking about quality, though, uh, just because you're doing things in a, a lean way, you don't this does not necessarily mean that you give up engineering practices, that you don't pair if you do that, that you don't test drive some of your code. Uh, it's, you want to make sure that it's a, a lean startup, but it's not anorexic. So talking about testing, there was a guy actually in the Ruby community. I was doing some stuff in Ruby on Rails about a year and a half ago. And this guy, Obi Fernandez, basically said, startups shouldn't write tests, which was kind of heresy for the Ruby community, because one of the, the good things to come out of there is they've got a, a pretty healthy respect for both unit and acceptance testing. And so I was like, well, I think this guy's wrong. But lots of people listen to him. He, he's got his own signature series of Addison Wesley books in the, uh, in the Ruby world. He's fairly influential. So I'm like, maybe I should give this a go. And at the time, I was working a CTO of a, a startup that had, by this time, changed its name to Pow Wow. And the basic idea was, imagine if you could, uh, it was one of these, another one of these social sharing sites where you can like follow people and topics and conversations. But it had some fairly complex business rules. So what I did was I, I spent about a, a day, day and a half building a first cut of the, the core engine in terms of what notifications who should get when whatever conversations were updated. And then I realized, OK, how am I actually going to test this? And I started to do it. I opened up four different browsers and created four different user accounts and made one follow one person and another follow a topic but not the people and another contribute to the conversation but not follow it and to try and set up all these. And I realized it was going to take me like a week to figure out how to test it. And I still wouldn't have any degree of confidence that I caught all of the use cases. So I threw away about a day and a half's worth of work. And in two days, I managed to test drive exactly the same functionality with kind of pretty good coverage of unit tests. And this is something where I generated the, the output from. It's RSpec. It's kind of like a, a jbehave. It's a BDD testing framework in the Ruby world that allowed me to very clearly output to the business team. These are the, these, actually, what I did was I outputted the descriptions of all of the tests on a weekly basis and committed them into the GitHub repo. So what I was able to do was show the diffs each week. 
So I could say each week, so just to be clear, these are the three new business rules you've added in green, and those were the three business rules you didn't want anymore. Is that correct? So it was actually ended up being a really nice communication tool, because even the business team was running out of focus in terms of, I can't remember, what did we say this thing was supposed to do? So it was able to describe and make it easy for people to work with. Another important part of testing is acceptance testing. And it's tough. I was at a meeting in Pivotal Labs uh, in, in New York uh, maybe six months ago where one of the product owners there kind of pulled together a bunch of engineers and said, should we have acceptance tests for early stage projects? Because I just feel like every time the engineering team builds a bunch of acceptance tests using Selenium or Cucumber or whatever they're working with, it slows us down so much. Because every time I want to make a meaningful change to the UI, they're like, oh, that's going to change 50 different tests. We're going to have to change all this stuff. And basically, the takeaway for me from that meeting, and I was talking with Jez Humble, one of the, the authors of the continuous, uh, continuous Delivery. I always want to say Continuous Deployment, Continuous Delivery book. And we kind of agreed that one of the things that we find is most compelling is not you don't want to get rid of acceptance tests, but you need to do them right. And the two biggest mistakes that we see kind of when we consult with teams one is that a lot of people create brittle acceptance tests. If you have an acceptance test that includes a string, you're probably doing it wrong, right? You know, if you've got acceptance tests that say, I go to this page and it should say, thank you for adding a new user, that's the wrong thing to do. You should be looking for an ID or something on the DOM that is less likely to change. And also that's going to work when you internationalize the site. But the biggest source of problems that I see with Acceptance tests is actually a function of doing Agile right, but not understanding the implications. One of the things I really like about the, the capacity of engineering teams these days is a lot of the teams I work with will deliver stories in you know, two to six hours. Each like, little story they're working on will be just two, three, four hours of work, typically. And they can add a little more richness to their system, and they'll add two or three CUKEs or Selenium acceptance tests for each one of those new stories for the, uh, the success path, the failure path, and maybe one edge case. And that's a really good thing to do because you're delivering more business value every few hours. The business team can actually see, yes, that's right. The registration system does do that now. Now please add this. So it's actually a really good way of working. The only problem is if you leave those acceptance tests there. If you leave those acceptance tests there, what you end up with, if you build a registration system that takes you maybe two weeks, if you're building that in half-day chunks and you're doing three acceptance tests per story, well, you're going to have 60 or more acceptance tests for your registration system, which makes no sense at all. That's way too much. So what you need to do is every time that you, you go green on your acceptance tests and the story is accepted by your product owner or business analyst, what you want to do is rip out those acceptance tests and replace them with user journeys. If I've got a registration system, unless it's incredibly complex, I probably expect to have three or four acceptance tests for that by the time I'm finally done with it, even if I've been working on it for two or even three weeks. I'm going to have one positive path, one negative path, and maybe something that covers an unusual flow. And everything else I'm going to push down into functional or unit tests. So that I still have good test coverage. I still have a lot of confidence in the fact that the application is going to work well. But I don't have hundreds or thousands of slow running acceptance tests that are incredibly brittle. So when I make a meaningful change in the flow of the registration form, that should break one or two tests not 40 or 50. I want to ask a, a question about in integration. Who here, actually, firstly, who here, just out of interest, who here is using a distributed version control system, like Git, Mercurial, Bazaar, something like that? Uh, who here is still on like Subversion, Perforce, something? OK. So final question for that, then. Who here is using? feature branches. Like, you know, you go off and create a topic or a feature branch every time you add a new feature. OK, so it's, it's a really interesting thing that I think there's been a trend in the development world. And it's, it's 
faster or slower in different communities and even different parts of the country in the world. But there's a general trend towards using feature branches. Uh, I do some enterprise training for GitHub, and one of the things we'll often talk about with our customers is how to use a feature branch workflow. So the basic principle, I've got an e-commerce store. I want to add a contact us form. I'm going to check out a new branch called contact us, and I'm going to go work on that, add the functionality. I'll do a pull request if I'm using Git and GitHub, get somebody else on the team to look at the functionality, and if they check it out, it, the tests run well for them, they think it works well, they'll merge it into master. And at any given time, master, the kind of main branch, should be releasable. And that's actually a really good practice. So for the last two, maybe three years, I've been spending a lot of time recommending to engineering teams that they trend towards this feature branching approach. So every time you want to build a, non a, a new feature, and this could be a half day of work for one engineer, or this could be a couple of weeks, three weeks worth of work for a team of two or even four developers. In each case, creating a feature branch and then merging it back into master. So unfortunately, now that I've been saying all these good things about feature branches, and if you don't use them, you actually should start, uh, but for anyone who's using them, unfortunately, I've got some bad news. Feature branches, even though they're a good next step from not using them, are evil. Well, wh where am I getting this from? Well, I'm going to use an appeal to authority. This guy, Martin Fowler, for anyone who doesn't know him, who wrote this book amongst many others, that's the, is that refactoring, refactoring to patterns, patterns of enterprise architecture, wrote a bunch of books, said that feature branches are evil. Okay, not convinced. Well, actually, let me give you a little more detail. What actually happened is this guy, who you might actually see, he gave a, a workshop on Monday, this is Jez Humble that I mentioned, who wrote this book, along with Dave Farley, Continuous Delivery, using practices at, uh, similar to those you see at companies like Etsy, said that feature branches are evil. Why is that? And why should you care? Well, it turns out one feature branch, I was talking with Martin Fowler, Neil Ford, and some other people at a, a ThoughtWorks seminar in New York about a year and a half ago, and he made the point, a long-running feature branch is fine, but the problem runs when you have more than one long-running feature branch. So what are we talking about here? I've got an engineering organization, a real small team, maybe there's eight developers. I've got four of them working on uh, my account feature and four of them working on uh, a new checkout system for an e-commerce store. And both of them create a feature branch. Now, both of them, so imagine these are like the, the two feature branches going down here. Both of them are actually going to pull from master on a regular basis. So if you like fix a bug on master, that will be in both of their code bases, no problems at all. The challenge is, let's say that they go along this way for a week, two weeks, a month. Imagine if in the very first day when they created those two feature branches, both teams decided to create a method with the same name but doing something different, and with the same signature in terms of the, the properties, it takes two integers, but doing totally different things. So what's going to happen? Well, initially nothing, because they're both off on feature branches, they're both pulling any bug fixes from master, and both of their sets of code is working absolutely fine. The pro and in fact, even when one of the teams merges back into master, still no problem at all, no merge conflict, shouldn't be any issues at all. The problem arises when the second team decides to merge back into the master branch. Because now, they're going to have to go back through the last month of coding for both sets of teams to try and figure out at what point in time that other team created that method and what they're going to have to do to make all their code that relies on a method doing something different with that name actually work. Uh, and this is so bad. I remember I used to go into enterprises and coach teams. And one of the things I would often do is I kind of sidle up to the other team leads and be like, so guys, when are you planning on like merging that new feature you're working on? And they might be, oh, you know, Friday afternoon. So I kind of run back to my team, right? Okay, we've got to merge in Friday morning, whatever happens. Because somebody's losing their weekend and I don't want it to be us. So I'm not sure that was the right thing to do, but that is the, the situation you get into when you have long running feature branches. So I don't 
know whether feature branches are evil, but I would definitely say that there are a number of things that you want to think about to try and fix this problem. The first thing I would do is start working with your product owners to make your feature branches shorter. And so I find now, generally, a long-running feature branch I used to define as more than a week. These days, I would define a long-running feature branch as one that's open for more than a day. Most of the features I work on now, with, the, with most of the teams I work on, are delivered same business day. Now, but you might be like, well, wait a minute. Let's say you're building some non-trivial functionality. It's going to take a team of people more than a day to do it. How do you do that? And so there are a number of patterns and strategies. I'm going to talk about something like feature toggles in a little bit. Uh, another pattern is branch by abstraction, which is it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually not branching, but rather it's creating a facade between, let's say, you're trying to swap out from MySQL to MongoDB. Uh, what it allows you to do is create a facade so that then you can make lots of small changes to your code, keep committing it to master without breaking things, without having to make an all or nothing change from one data store to another in one go. So I'll come back to that in a little while. But there's another kind of testing that I want to talk about. So I talked about unit tests and acceptance tests. I want to talk about business testing. One of the most common experiences I have when I deal with a CEO or a product owner or a business analyst or a, a, a team lead who has some kind of product responsibility is they'll come to me and say, we need to build this. And the first question I'll ask is, why? What is your assumption that this is going to do? What do you expect this to do? And it's important for this not to be based on vanity metrics. Oh, we think more people will come to use our website if we add this new feature. Well, how do you know that adding that new feature makes more people come to your website? Your website traffic's probably just going to keep going up as long as you're not dead and as long as people still talk about you. But how are we going to be able to identify that it was the new feature and not the fact that you got tech crunched that week that actually made the difference? So what you need instead is some way of running experiments. So typically, what you'll do is you'll run some kind of uh, cohort analytics. Who here has heard of this term? I just want to sense. OK, so I'll mention this and explain it. So the basic principle is, let's say that you have 800 users sign up for an application over a 30-day period. 400 of them you will give the new feature to, and 400 of them you will not give the new feature to. You'll assign them to two cohorts, two groups, A-B split testing. Let's say, for example, we have the hypothesis that if we Pinterest people, they will keep coming back. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that Pinterest did that happened to be successful for them was they annoyed the heck out of you. Every single time one of your Facebook friends signed up for Pinterest, they sent an email saying, hey, somebody else has joined Pinterest. Now, you can make a reasonable argument as to whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Because either users are going to be like, oh, wow, all my friends are using Pinterest. I should go back there. Or people are going to be like, if they don't stop st spamming me, not only am I going to unsubscribe, but I may blow up their main campus. You know, It's like, enough already. Stop sending me hundreds of emails. And you can make a reasoned argument for both points of view. The fact is, we don't really know. But what you could do is, if you've got 800 people signing up over the next month, is do it to 400 of them, not do it to 400 of them, and you need to have a disprovable hypothesis. This is where most people go wrong. They run the cohort analytics and they say, oh, I don't know, I guess people seem to be happy, so we'll keep doing it. So start with a disprovable hypothesis. I believe that engagement defined as the number of uh, times somebody returns to our site within a given week will be at least 5% higher for users that we Pinterest, for users that we send these, hey, your Facebook friend has just signed up messages to. And then you run the experiment for 30 days, and at the end of the month, you can then look at the data and say, either we hit the disprovable hypothesis, so we're going to roll this out to all our users. We came nowhere close to it, so we should not only switch this feature off, but actually excise the code from the code base. The last thing you want to do is leave functionality in your code base that you're not using or planning on using. Or it was like it was really close. We got 4% better engagement instead of 5%. We think we can tweak that. We're going to work on the subject lines and the messagings and the call to actions to try and bring people in more successfully. 
Now, the question is, how do you implement this? And this is one of the many things that you'll use feature toggles for. And feature toggles are, are really interesting to me. Sometimes they're called feature flags. Uh, Facebook has its gatekeeper system, which is an example of this. But basically, it's the most overhyped if statement in the world. Right? When it really comes down to it, if you've heard of feature tags and feature uh, toggles and stuff like that, all it really is is an if statement that says, well, I don't know, if you're part of this cohort, then I'm going to Pinterest you, and if you're not part of this cohort, I'm not. Or if we're in production, I'm not going to display this feature yet, because even though it's, it's not breaking the build, we're not actually ready to launch it. One of the reasons you would use a feature tag is to go back to this idea of, um, of smaller feature branches. You might create feature branches for building part of a checkout system and then merge them back into master, but basically have an if statement that says, we're not going to allow anyone to check out in production just yet. That way you can reduce your, uh, your integration risk. You can make sure that that code integrates in master and that it doesn't break anything, but you don't have to worry about having a fully formed checkout system that might take you a month to build. You can actually just commit parts of it into master and just kind of hide them from your users for a period of time. So the implementation of this is uninteresting, but what really is interesting is the range of things you can do if you add feature toggles to your system. So we already talked about this idea of cohort analytics. So that what you can do is you can create feature flags both on the front end, hey, we're gonna show some users search, and we're gonna show some users a taxonomy-based system that they can navigate through, and we'll see which ones are, are most likely to buy from us or stay on the site for more than a period of time or whatever it is we care about. But there's a bunch of other things you can do as well. One of the things that can be really interesting is the ability to do canary rollouts. So the idea of this is the kind of uh, canary in the coal mine so that it, it kind of dies before the miners do. And sometimes, even though you've tested your code well, that doesn't actually mean it will work at scale in production with the production database and the production environment. Even though we create staging areas that have a production-like environment, it's still not the same as being in production. So once you think everything's good, do you really want to press the button and roll this out to every single user? Or if you have a large user base, would you like to just be able to roll it out to a subset of users? Firstly, maybe you just roll it out to people at your IP addresses, so it's only your employees. Then over time, maybe you roll it out to certain markets, or just 5% of users, or just one out of n different production servers that you're running. In each one of these cases, it's a way that you can reduce the risk of pushing code to production, because worst case, if you suddenly find that uh, your load on your database servers, because these queries that seemed good on the staging server are just dying when you have millions of records or there's something specific in your production database that's killing it, you can just use a, a feature flag to, to roll back that functionality and you've only inconvenienced three or five percent of your users. You've not taken the entire application down for everyone who works with it. Connected with that, the idea of real-time feature switching you can actually switch features because typically for most of us, if we want to change the functionality of a running web application, most of the time we need to run our build system and run our deployment system and push to production. And that takes a non-trivial amount of time. It might be completely automated and only take a few minutes, but it doesn't take a fraction of a second. It still takes time. Well, with real-time feature switching, there's no reason why the variables that are used by your, your if statements, by your, your feature flags, can't be set using an administrative panel. So you can go build an admin interface where I, as, as an operations engineer, or even as somebody in marketing or somebody somewhere else in the company, can just switch features on and off, either for the entire application or for groups of users. And it even allows you to do something like a, a production immune system, which is, uh, reminds me of some of the things that Etsy does. So, uh, I always like the story that at Etsy, what they will do is they require every new engineer to push to production on their first day. How many people here would feel comfortable about bringing somebody into your company with no experience and requiring them to actually push some code to production on their first day at work? 
Uh, yeah, most people are like, eh, maybe for six months or a year. And some people, I still remember the one guy I was talking to at, at uh, another conference, he was like, I'm not gonna let those kids push to production until it's over my code dead body. You know, it's like he wanted to make sure that he was the only person that would allow code to go to production because we're worried about them breaking stuff. Well, Etsy's perspective is, man, if somebody who's only here a day knows very little about our system and isn't, isn't malicious, isn't trying to, you know, on their first day in the job, they're not trying to get fired, manages to break our website, then clearly our testing isn't robust enough. We need to go fix our tests rather than stop the interns or the new programmers from being able to push to production. So uh, the way a production immune system works is not only do you have your unit tests and functional tests and acceptance tests, but you actually have business metrics. And what it'll do is it'll say, let's say, for example, that I'm working on uh, a checkout page for an e-commerce store. And I decide to change it so that I'm going to make the checkout button white text on a white button with no border on a white background. Which of your automated tests are going to catch that? Unit tests don't touch the view at all. And your acceptance tests are going to be using an ID to pick out the buttons so that they're not going to figure it out either. So what you do is you write a set of tests that basically say, we usually expect to sell X amount of dollars every hour. If for some period of time we dramatically drop below that just after we push to production, we should probably roll the code back, send the statistics to the engineer and say, we don't know if something's broken, but suddenly nobody was buying things from our website. Could you go look at the code you just committed? And automatically roll that back. And so that's the idea of actually having a more robust testing system so that even if somebody makes a, a stupid mistake or something that your regular tests don't catch, you're unlikely to get in trouble on a business level. So of course, I've been saying how awesome this idea of feature toggles are. And I'm pretty sure that at a conference in the next year or two, you're going to see this slide. Feature toggles are evil. And if you don't believe that, let, let me tell you why. It'll probably be on my deck, because I'm, I, I've already talked to some companies that are like, yeah, we have like 84 different feature toggles, and we're finding it hard to do comprehensive acceptance testing for every possible combination. I'm like, yeah, you probably are, because that's a really stupid idea to have 84 different uh, experiments in progress at the same time. It's just not realistic. So it's important to realize you need to use these things uh, in, a, in a balanced way. Very quickly, another thing you want to be thinking about is tracking, whether it's tools like KISS Metrics or Mixpanel, but something that allows you to do segmentation and funnel analysis to really understand the, the usage of your application. And so just to wrap this up, because we're almost right on time. Firstly, the big takeaway is maybe if our job, is our job to write software or to solve business problems? If it's to write software, then maybe I wasted an hour of your time. Feel free to keep writing code that potentially nobody is ever going to use. Personally, I'm not interested in doing that. I, I tend to turn down jobs if I know that I'm going to spend most of the time building something that sounds like a really stupid idea to me. So maybe the first thing is step away from the computer. The first thing to do when somebody comes to you with a feature is say, why are we building this? And what evidence do we have that anyone's going to care once it launches? The second thing, feature branches may be evil. You should absolutely use them, but you should make them as short as possible and make sure that you use functionality like feature toggles so that you can easily uh, reduce the amount of integration debt, which is basically what you're creating when you have these long running feature branches. And then finally, it's important to think about creating meaningful metrics and making sure that that's part of what you deliver as part of your software not just, it's not an application until you can actually run tests and ensure that it's solving the business problem that it was actually designed to address. We've got just five minutes, so uh, let me open it up and see any questions. So, so it's a great question, and the question is, how do you make all this stuff work in a large enterprise? Because often you've got a boss who's not thinking in these terms. And generally, it's interesting, Jez is going to be working on a, a book, I believe, that, that's going to be addressing exactly that, that topic. But at a high level, what you typically have to do is work within the governance structures you already have. Like it or not, 
most large companies are just gonna be like, hey, here's a million dollars to go solve this problem with 400 people over two years, go do it. And so you're probably not gonna be able to convince a high enough level of management to say, hey, we should run 20 different experiments instead and then double down on the experiments that make most sense. But what you can do within that high level vision statement is say, are the stakeholders gonna mind how we solve this problem or just that we solve the problem? And then what we should do is say, how can we take small teams in two and three week iterations to do some early validated learning so we learn a little more about the kind of problem we're solving and then we can decide from there what to double down on. So it's a matter of trying to find ways of fitting this within a, a, a larger scale process that probably won't change anytime soon. Any other questions? Great, well thank you very much for coming out.